back from the alert training program. You notice how alert he is now? Second Timothy chapter 1. Be praying for these students that Brother Paul and I have and others that we're getting some exposure to. The language barrier, I, I had the Bible open within 24 hours of her being here. Language barrier is too great to... But I googled a picture of you know Christ supposedly on the cross and the passion of the Christ. You know what this is? No idea. What's that? Yeah, tongues. Maybe by the end of the month she'll... Today we're talking about Deborah's got her little girls there. She says, Deborah babysits. Sits? <laughs> really? What do you sit on the baby? You know, it's... You, the, the things that we say... So the poor thing, Deborah, went up there today, and it was she had to get something, and it was like 85 degrees in the room. Well, she was too unfamiliar with the air conditioner. I'm feeling like a heel, but we're all set there. Okay, what did I say? Second Timothy? All right, Second Timothy. What a good book we got, and a great God we serve. Amen? It's a, it's a warm night in July. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for your church, your book, your Holy Ghost, your people, your calling, your ministry, your, your gifts, Lord. And what a blessing, Lord. And we're just, we're, you daily load us with benefits, Lord. Our, our worst day is better than being lost. And we thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for those that are with us tonight and those that aren't, those that are traveling, those that are moved away those that are missioning and ministering tonight and uh, Lord, we just we just thank you for your people pray for the other churches in the community and around the globe even tonight that are ministering and uh, trying to reach your people and and feed them and I pray that you'd help me to just uh, bless your people with your word tonight as you blessed me in Jesus name we pray amen all right I'm going to entitle this first message the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to Timothy. You don't have to put all that. Just put uh, I'll get to it when we get there, okay? If you got it, say amen. Amen, amen. all right. Timothy, Second Timothy. Uh, Timothy means honoring to God or dear to God. Isn't that nice? Dear to God. There's four chapters in your English Bible, 83 verses, 1,703 eternal, inspired, preserved, living words of the living God. After uh, studying this afternoon and reading different summaries and, you know, these Bible correctors and scholars and different things, uh, that don't believe that this is the pure inspired word. I just had a uh, hope this is a blessing to you as a, was a blessing to me. Uh, the man I was reading when he got all done and all these people that don't believe the Bible, some ghost author, you know, wrote, wrote Timothy and, and one of the hidden books and this and that, and it's not in the canon. He says, Here is the kiss of God on the soul of lost mankind. Here is the monarch of books. Let him roar and let the shepherds tremble, Isaiah 31.4. Here is the book of books towering above the loosely scattered and lost collection of original autographs like Mount Everest above Mount Blanc. Biblios, the book. 
Our ears are bowed. Our hearts are ready to apply. We desire these words to be on our lips. We acknowledge that they are excellent things and counsels and knowledge. And if not one faculty member in one Christian college, seminary, or university on the face of the earth is certain of, about them, we are. We are ready to answer the words of truth. There will be no uncertain sound, no strange children, no good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. There will only be plain, clear, pure, holy truth from the words of truth given by the one who is the truth incarnate. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And that ought to be our approach, and I hope it's your approach to, uh, to this word of God tonight. Now, why... Uh, why liberals and modernists? I'm going to preach a little bit here. I don't see no visitors, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I was going to try to be dignified tonight, but I feel it fleed, fleeting me fast. Uh, they can't stand this, these pastoral books. These pastoral books. Uh, number one, they exalt doctrine. They exalt doctrine. Doctrine is simply uh, truth, and that's something that's long gone today. Uh, the church is a hundred miles wide and a quarter inch deep. And that's why people are anemic. My people perish for lack of knowledge. They couldn't fight their spiritual way out of a paper bag, amen? Uh, truth and doctrine in the pastoral epistles, which would be First and Second Timothy, uh, uh, Titus, 59 times, 59 times. Uh, they say there's no absolutes. When someone says to you, there's no absolutes, you say, are you absolutely sure? They exalt doctrine. They demand exposure of and separation from false teaching and heresy. So there goes the National Council of Churches. There goes the ecumenical movement. There goes the crowd that says, ah, oh, it really doesn't matter what you do, what you say, who you hang out with. Uh, mark them which cause division contrary to the doctrine that ye have learned and avoid them. And the reason is, you might be the first generation and be able to handle it. And listen, I'm all for taking the meat and spitting the bones from anybody you can get. You'll find that the guys are real good, good, good doctrine, in my experience anyways, are not real, real good on the family. The guys that are real, real good on the family aren't real, real good on the doctrine. I'm not saying that we got it all together, but uh, be able to take the meat, spit out the bones, love everybody, be persuaded by nobody. That's a trouble with young people. Everyone they see, they, well, they do it this way and they do it that way. Yeah, but we're not them. One, one guy said, well, they do it this way in Bermuda. We're not in Bermuda. We're here. We're stiff northerners. Amen? I think it was Charlie Andrews said, up, he said, up north they have Bible conferences. He says, we're not having a conference. We're having revival. Amen? He said, he said, you can shout, you can scream, you can jump up. Just be sure when you land on your feet, you're speaking English. Amen? Okay, so they demand exposure of and separation from false teaching. They rebuke the misuse of the law. They mix law and grace. So there goes your JWs, Mormons, Amish, Mennonite, Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, full gospel. And I could say I love them, but just disagree with them. Amen? They establish Christ's deity. There goes every religion that said Jesus was just a good guy. This person I was talking to said uh, Jesus was a prophet, a prophet. And they weren't, they weren't argumentative at all. I mean, this person is nowhere near the stronger persuasion that their parents were, and their parents are nowhere near uh, the strong persuasion that we might associate with those Middle Eastern uh, religions. And I said, is that, you know, you don't, you don't wear the thing and all that? And uh, no, that, that's my choice. Are they sad? No, well, maybe a little bit. Do you argue? No, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't argue. Uh, lots of people say Jesus was a nice guy. Not too many say he was God. Amen. Uh, they specify who is qualified to pastor. Well, that leaves the equal rights movement out because I uh, suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp her authority in the church. You say, you can't say that today. I didn't. I just read it. Uh, and it'll leave a whole lot of pastors in America out. Uh, it exalts the local church. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so much for the home church movement. Listen, I know a lot about the home church movement. 
I know a lot about it. I I know the people in it. I, I know why it was. I know why it came about. But you don't, this is heavy, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You, you don't throw every problem out. You fix them, all right? So the church forsakes the family. Well, you fix it. You don't forsake the church. Now you got, you know, two bad wrongs don't make it right. Is that what they say? Uh, the I do God, but I don't do the church. Well, then you don't do God's will. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. You're going to spit at his bride. You're going to neglect his bride. And uh, we, we sent Brother Snyder. There was a group one time. We tried to replicate what we have here across the country, and you couldn't, you couldn't get two men to work together. This is, this is an oddity. She's back. All right, these books reveal the apostasy of the last days. And let me say this. The biggest shock I see in these last days is the shock of believers as what's going on. Why are we so shocked? Are we so, why are we so, Can you believe what they're doing? They're breaking down international walls. They're moving away from God. Really? <laughs> Let me tell you what the movement is going to be. 30, 30 churches are closing in America every day. Yeah? Right on schedule. Right on schedule. Uh, away from God what God says. If God says, I formed thee in the womb, you know what you're going to find? Death in the womb. You know the party I was watching, I, 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 had, I had to get sick. We are the party of the little guy. Yeah, except unless that little guy's in the womb. The most dangerous place in America is in a mother's womb. That's terrible. Isn't that terrible? And you got the audacity to talk about environmental justice when they're ripping up babies in the womb god help us that's going to be uh the way things are going. there's going to be more evil there's going to be more violence i mean i hate to see it i mean them those, those nuts man they went in a they went in a catholic church in france and took an 82 year old priest and sliced his throat in front of the congregation this week and that is grievous and, and sickening and sad. But when I'm going to Ohio and I see these road signs that say Dayton, there's a part of me that says, we're right on schedule. We're right on track. Getting towards the end, getting towards the end. So, so let's, let's not be surprised Let's be busy. If you know you're in the fourth quarter, whether you got gray hair or not, if we're in the fourth quarter, our salvation is nearer than when we appeared. So we don't want to get shocked. We want to get busy. We want to get busy. All right? Uh, These books are going to exalt, exalt the perfect Word of God, and that leaves out a whole bunch of believers, what we call believers. Now, you see what a minority Bible believers are? Listen, if you believe, oh, aren't you sick of this discrimination junk? Don't talk to me about minorities. If you believe every word of God is pure in the Bible, if you believe and practice as best you can, I'm talking about like the uh, 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 being keepers at home and being adorned in modest apparel and a uh, woman not usurping authority and, wa- and all that stuff, you're a bigger minority than the spotted owl. There's no one even close to the minority in which you live. See if you can find 10 churches in the country that believe what you believe. You know what they want to do? They want to get rid of this book. Let's set the scene. 64 to 68 A.D., about 35 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel's being propagated around the world and has even slid into the hallways of Caesar's household. 
Now the Roman persecutions under Nero are in full swing. Uh, if you don't have Haley's Bible, Hale, Haley, how do you say your name? Haley or Haley? Let's not start that. Uh, page, uh, I, I'm reading here. Boy, this Nero, he was something else. The Neronian persecution. The great fire in Rome occurred on A.D. 64. Nero himself burned the city. Through an inhumane, though an inhumane brute, he was a great builder. It was in order to build a new and grander Rome that he set fire to the city and fiddled in glee at the sight of it. The people suspected him, and historians have commonly regarded as a fact that he was the perpetrator of the crime. In order to divert suspicion from himself, he accused the Christians of burning Rome. The Bible makes no mention of Nero's persecution of Christians, though it happened in the Bible times and is a direct background of at least two New Testament books, 1 Peter and 2 Timothy. I'm just laying groundwork tonight, and then we'll get going Sunday. And was the persecution that brought Paul to his martyrdom. And according to some traditions, Peter also. Our source of information is the Roman historian Tacitus. He knew that the Christians did not burn Rome, but somebody had to be made the scapegoat for the emperor's crime. Here was a new and despised sect of people, mostly from the humbler walks of life. Nothing's changed. Without prestige or influence, nothing's changed. Many of them slaves. Nero accused them of burning Rome and ordered their punishment. In and around Rome, multitudes of Christians were arrested and put to death in the most cruel ways, crucified, or tied in skins of animals and thrown into the arena to be worried to death by dogs for the entertainment of the people, or thrown to the wild beasts, or tied to stakes in Nero's garden, pitch poured over their bodies, and their burning bodies used as torches to light Nero's gardens at night while he drove around in his chariot naked, indulging himself in the midnight revels, gloating over the dying agonies of his victims. In the wake of this persecution that Paul was rearrested in Greece or Asia Minor, probably at Troas, and brought back to Rome, this time the agents of Rome, not as at first by the Jews, this time as a criminal. Persecute, listen to this. Persecution began as a social reaction and became political later, a process which can be detected. Paul is in jail, chapter 1, verse 8. He's chained, chapter 1, verse 16, and he's in Rome. Rome jailed Peter. Rome jailed James. Rome jailed John the Baptist. Rome jailed Paul, and they killed three of the four of them. And that's only what's in the Bible, so uh, beware of Rome. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is, this is where we're at. I'm trying to set the tune, uh, the, the tone for this, uh, this book, writing to this young pastor, chapter 4 and verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul is ready to be martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. But you see the slant he had on that? I'm ready to be offered an offering, an offering over to uh, 2 Timothy 1.8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or me, his, not Nero's prisoner, not Rome's prisoner, not the bad guy's prisoner, or he called himself the prisoner of the Lord. Now, you know in God's economy, let's see if we got any of my Bible students. I, bet I was going to call on Dylan because he always gets it right, make me look good. But uh, watch this, watch Jason. He's only, you're in your second year? Okay, he's going to second year. In God's economy, you can't get away with doing good, and you can't get away with doing either way. You can't get away with doing wrong, be sure your sin will find you out, and you can't get away with doing right. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How's that for a prosperity gospel? You're going to get it either way. You do right, you're going to get it from the evil. You do wrong, you're going to get it from the good God. I see these guys on TV the sowing their seed of faith in God's garden. You know where Paul's seed ended up bearing fruit? On the chopping block. 
What if I could give you an instant cure for worry and anxiety and fear? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. I'm trying to set the stage of what this guy's, where he's sitting in a Roman prison, in chains. If we could get this, brethren, but none of these things move me, verse 24, neither count I my life dear unto myself. And that's when he said, so that I might finish my course with joy. Because as long as I'm counting this life dear unto myself, you know what? It's going to get ripped away one of these days. If uh, it doesn't leave you, you're going to leave it. Imagine life no, being so spiritual, so getting a call from another world, so seeing the things which are invisible, so having your conversation in heaven that life is no longer endeared. Nothing's going to bother you. Nothing's going to penetrate you. Nothing is going to sadden you. That's the situation this man is under. Look at Philippians 1. Philippians 1. I don't know how bad things are going to get. Maybe we'll float out. I asked James Knox, where is America in the book of Revelation? He said, I don't see it. <laughs> now that could be good. Maybe we'll have big castle walls built around the whole thing, or maybe she's not there. That could be bad. Philippians, but unless, unless my life's not dear to myself, then what's the difference? 121, Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ. Look at these words. And to die is gain. We don't believe a word of that. You imagine going to the doctor and getting a report tomorrow afternoon. Really? Really? As if you won the lottery? You know what that Bible just said about Grandma Lillian and Grandma Dell and Dave Hanson, Ken Parfit and Lily Robinson? I could go on and on all day. They gained. And if we're going to survive in a jail cell, and we're going to survive in Rome, and we're going to survive in chains, we're going to have to let go of this life. And see him who is invisible. Now, I know the flesh, and none more than mine, uh, rises up and said, No, don't say that. Paul had something going. So here are Paul's, here are Paul's, 2 Timothy, departing words. His last will and testament, if you will. And you know what he does? He writes to a young preacher. Now, you know, Paul, you know, a lot of us are middle age. I'm being generous. And neither of my sets of parents are up here, so I could have a little bit of liberty. You know, unless you're like super duper, you can't help but when it's just the, the evil side, I think. You know, when you get to coming to the end of your road, and, or your parents are coming to the end of your road, you know, you're wondering, I want to, I ain't leaving anything behind. Now, I know none of you kids would think that about us first-generation parents, you know, because you, would, you wouldn't think that for five minutes, would you? If it, I wonder what this, I wonder what's going to divvy up here. You know what Paul left behind? Nothing. Amen. If he died there, they never even got a coat to him. He left nothing. But I'll tell you what, he left a young man rich. He, you realize what he left behind? 
Do you realize all that has been afforded us, the freedoms and the opportunities to minister to people? He's working from a jail cell. You talk about little as much if God is in it. And he conquered Rome by writing letters. And he changed the world. And 2,000 years later, we're reading what he wrote. He didn't say, oh, what am I doing in here? i got to get out of here. Write letters to the, to the parole board. I'll do this. I'll write the governor. i got to get out of here. He said, no, I'm just going to do content what God has called me to do. He said, as poor, yet making many rich, and he didn't leave them a dime. He said, as having nothing, yet I possess all things. Woo, that's freedom right there, brethren. So we're embarking in 2 Timothy on what Paul is leaving behind. I'm not opposed to physical inheritance, believe me. But let me say this to the less fortunate parents. You don't have to have something to leave something. You don't have to have physical anything to leave spiritual everything. Isn't that a blessing? It's been said to plan like you're going to live a hundred years, but live like you don't have tomorrow. And, and, and this is the thought I want to get across today, just not even just, just off the title and what Paul is doing here in his final time in this world. If you're getting gray hairs and people know it or not, or you're the water stops going down the drain when you're washing your hair. As our daily, if you're in that season of life, your life is probably busier than ever before. You start getting teenagers running around and, and, and health issues and, and, and crossroads in life and responsibilities and the, and the rent's going up and the taxes are going up and the health care is going up and you're going down. While we are consumed with our duties, we need to have one eye on what we are going to leave behind. And I don't mean physical inheritance. I'm talking about what we're going to leave if God tarries and we are off the scene, namely for our children and those that come behind us. You know there's only two things in the world from the Bible that have no end. And it's not your marriage, and it's not your family, and it's not your possessions, and it's not your government, and it's not your rights. It's not even the dirt you're standing on or the stars that you're looking at. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, I'll show you. I'll show you where the true riches are. These are simple verses that we should all know, but... Every generation needs to hear them. You know, sometimes we preach. I've been preaching for 30 years. Oh, I can't preach that. I preached that 25 years ago. Yeah, but 60% of you weren't even on the earth 20 years ago, let alone here. Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. I believe he's pointing to himself. There's 20 verses in the Bible that God is the rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So you are part of something, and I'm not going to get into the, 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 the universal and the local and what you can see and what you can't see, uh, I, I, but, but you are part of something that will have no end until the end. All right, now Matthew 24. That's one thing. So as I'm consumed with my daily duties and my daily ministry and my daily responsibilities and my daily cares, I got one eye looking at what I'm leaving behind and what is their connection to what is going to last. I hope it's not America because that might not be it. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. 
this wasn't planned. I'll take it as from the Lord. I hope this is not the first graduating class that's all going to go to secular university and no one's going to take Bible. If anyone needs Bible, it's you. you got to get it somewhere, man. They'll eat you alive. They'll humiliate you. They'll, they, they'll scorn you for Christ's sake. Well, I'm, and I'm not saying you've got to get it from us or get it from me, but you better have that Bible down. That's what's not going to pass away. The church and the Word. So here's the title. Paul's focus in the fourth quarter. Paul's focus in the fourth quarter. When you begin to gray, you begin to number your days. I probably, I always say I'm a year older than I really am. You know, I, oh my, but my wife, I can't say that to her. We're the same age. She's six months behind me. So if I say we're 56, I'm 55. I just told her age. <laughs> Paul's focus when it came time to the end, under the inspiration of God. So it's not just this guy sitting here, well, yeah, you know, I'm coming down the end of my road here. I better, uh, uh, uh. no, this is the Holy Spirit of God and influencing, inspiring him uh, to write. You know what his, his focus was? The church and the word of God. And they go hand in hand because the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. Listen, every epistle, every epistle that Paul wrote was to a church to church leaders or to churches. So that means everything that God wrote to individuals in the New Testament epistles for the church age were written to churches. 112 times in the New Testament, church and churches. Every New Testament writer mentions it. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be to church on a Wednesday night. Here's Paul's pattern. He goes and he preaches the gospel. He assembles believers. He appoints leaders to lead people who will do the same thing. Don't ever stray far from God's model. We got more parachurch ministries. We got more this. We got more that. Listen, preach the gospel. Assemble believers. Appoint leaders who will do it again. Every generation has done that. That's why we're here today. The perfecting of the saints. Who needs perfecting? The work of the ministry. I'm going to say the perfecting of the saints is inside. I'm going to say the work of the ministry is outside, although we minister to those inside. And then the edifying of the body of Christ. I'm going to say both sides because I don't know about you, but there's nothing to me more edifying than ministry. Commit thy work. You, you want to stop sinning for five minutes, you guys that can't get your mind off of dirty pictures and all that stuff? Go get in the face of a sinner. If nothing else, for about six minutes, you won't be thinking about nothing but, I wish I knew the Bible better. <laughs> Christ died for the church, Acts 20. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, 1 Timothy 3. God gives gifts to individuals in the church. God accomplishes his work for saints and sinners in the church. A hundred percent of the New Testament truths that govern our faith and practice were epistles written to churches or leaders in churches. Saved sinners were added to the church daily when they were saved. God directs his great commission, Acts 13, through the leaders of the church. The local church was to discipline its members. You don't see that much anymore. You discipline one and you lose 20. Uh, the local church is to ordain elders, uh, Titus chapter 1. The local church is to feed the flock. You know why it's so quiet? These are just facts. But it's the Word of God. It's the everlasting Word of God. Local church leaders are supposed to feed the flock. Local churches to keep the doctrine pure, Acts 15. Local church bishops are to train men to teach others. We'll see that when we get to 2 Timothy chapter 2. These elders must give account for the souls they rule. Those followers of those elders are to remember the elders, salute the elders, and obey them that have the rule over them. You say, you can't say that. I didn't. God said it. The early church met and ministered daily. And if I had to do it again, I probably wouldn't change it. 
But sometimes I wonder about, well, let's meet less so we can spend more time with our families. And I would say in the early days that started with a good model, but I wonder what it's come to on our Sunday afternoons today. At the end of the story in the book of Revelation, Christ addresses his words to local churches that are represented here and in heaven. You can't beat it. You can't beat that church. Don't stray far from that church. You can't do better than the church. You can't uh, 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 improve it. The church is effective. The adversaries have been trying to shut it down. They burn people. They burn the people. They burn the books. They burn the Bibles. They burn the buildings. Oh, my, and we're still singing. Now they're burning. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let. That's the big, you know, doctrinal con- controversy. Uh, some say it's the Antichrist. I don't know how you could put the Antichrist. Just put the Antichrist, uh, only he, only the Antichrist now holds back and will hold back until the Antichrist be taken out of the way. Some say it's the civil authorities. These new guys that are saying we're going through the tribulation, and I'll tell you what, sometimes I've read these books, it rings in my ears when you see what's going on. People aren't going to go into law enforcement no more. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You go against law enforcement. Oh, that's real smart. Uh -uh. Go against law enforcement and take people's right to bear arms away. But I don't want to get political tonight. (laughs) It's the church holds back the mystery of iniquity. I want to be part of that. And if I had to leave dying words to any new believer, I'd say, find a church that you love, get in full bore. Join up, yoke up, sign up, give up, stand up, and be counted. You are investing in something that will outlast you. Don't be standoffish toward it. Stand on it. If I had to make one suggestion to a missionary you know i don't want to get into this but uh just i i wrote a rebuttal to this book that this guy was he no god never called anybody to plant churches you know he's he's mocking our missionaries that get up there and say i'm i'm going there to preach the gospel and and plant indigenous churches only indigenous people can plant indigenous churches that's who we're winning man But with that said, and listen, I'm for, I'm for every line in the water that you could put in, man. Bobbers and trolling and deep sea and downriggers and planer boards and, and dynamite and nets and everything else to get any fish you can in the boat. But I'll tell you, the chances are way better 30 years from now, you'll still have something if when you get them, they get in a church. Where would you be without a church? Where would you be if you got saved as many years ago as you got saved and you live in North Korea? Or China? Or Yemen? Those, those believers don't know. I, I should take that back. But the, the people that I know that go to... You know, Joe. I mean, you can't preach deep stuff. He's preaching to these refugees in Sicily from Africa. And, and it's not like him and I are, you know, Charles Haddon Flintstone. And they're going, whoa! And they've been saved for years. We never heard stuff like this before. Thank God for the church. Don't get part in, get all in. You say, what about home church? 
I've yet to see one that fits the criteria. We're not talking about location. There's lots of home churches in the Bible. The church that was in their house, you'll see that. But I don't see a whole lot that preach and baptize and teach and disciple and reproduce and send missionaries to do it again. I see, let's us four and no more have our little farm and our little kids and they'll all marry each other and then we can get a little house out in the back 40 and we can all live happily ever after. You're dreaming. You know why? Because it's not God's design. Now, with that said, we're not talking about location. If Obama has his way, we might all be meeting in homes. You know this, this bathroom thing going on. You know what that's about. They're going to walk in here and say, you, you look it up. You Google it, what's going on in Oregon. That they, they made a thing and said, if it's open to the public, you have to regard what they think they are. So we might have to have the East Church and the West Church and the South Church and the North Church. and So we're not talking about where. We're talking about what? The church. Listen, here's what Jesus said. Man, Sabbath is, man is not for the Sabbath. Sabbath is for man. The church is for us. Oh, i got to go to church. Oh, we're always at church. It, hallelujah, you got one to go to. you imagine what some people would give to have a church? Paul's at the end of his road. And he said, I better close it out and write to this young pastor. You know what I'm doing while I'm doing everything else? I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm thinking down the road. I mean, you think I just want to check out of this thing and let everything swirl down the drain? No, sir. No, sir. Any more than you'd want to walk away from your house and just watch it be taken over by bats in the belfry. I, uh, I want my kids to be involved because it's something that will outlast me. What's your life insurance? Do I believe you should have life insurance? Yes. But I'll tell you what the soul insurance is and the sanity insurance is, is when, God forbid, something happens to the parents, the church carries on that they're a part of. I want my kids to be addicted to it. I want them to want to come early and want to stay late. I like when they're sick. And the sickness of not being able to go to church because they're sick is making them sicker than the sickness itself. I want them to make their friends in it. I want to meet their spouse. Now, some of you disagree. Oh, they're just going for their friends. They're not going for God like me. That's why when I come in, I come right down to the altar and I begin to commune with God. I don't go and tell my friend that we went for a motorcycle ride yesterday and how's the zucchinis coming and did you see that? It's all right to have friends in church. It's better than having them outside of church. I want them to meet their spouses in church. I want them to have their fun in it. I want God to deal with their sin in it. I want them to surrender their lives in it. I don't want them to be half in and half out. I don't want them to show up 60% of the time. I want them to come early and stay late. I want them given to it, sent from it, worshiping in it, loyal to its leaders, committed to its cause, and loving every minute of it, even when they're drowsy like we are tonight. When the Holy Ghost inspired a man to play a major role in something that even the gates of hell would not prevail against. He said, I'm going to write to that young pastor of that church. And I want to just publicly, Brother Jay, come on up, we'll just sing a song. I want to thank God for his church tonight. 
I'm glad for the Bible. I'm glad for salvation. I'm glad for Christ. I'm glad for the way he put everything together. But I want to thank God for his church. Man, there have been days I've been, I've, been, I've been lower than an ant. And you come in here and, you know, I, got a, I, I get to look out at you. I got everybody looking up at me. And, man, you want to sing like you want a headache. And you know about that third stanza, that second song? Something happens. Many days I didn't want to come. There was a season I didn't want to come. My wife said, can I be sick tonight? I know that never happened to you spiritual people, but I'll tell you what, I've never regretted, ever, coming to church. I want to thank God for his church. I want to thank God for the promises. And so I'm part of something that is not going to pass away. I want to thank God for his people, his people. Thank God you're in a church with some warm bodies. You got something. People say, you got a big church. Not really, but thank God we do. And sometimes you got a row of people missing here, they're away. You got a row of people missing there, they're away. Man, there's nobody in here. No, there's a whole lot more than we had the first week. I thank God for his people. I thank God for his plan for his church. And I thank God that I'm part of it. Let's all stand. Go each.